Hello and welcome to our time. Great to have your company once again. Janice, on today's show we have two very interesting people. Not that we don't have interesting people all the time. We're all the time. And you're looking at those two interesting people <laughs> right now. <laughs> now, later in today's program, we're going to be uh, talking to Connie Diano, who is uh, talking about... Uh, what Career. we do to sort of coach our lives along, you know, how to make our life better. Yeah. But we also have another lady who is just joining us now, Rosalind McLeod, who's really got some answers that may help you. Welcome to the program, Rosalind. Thank you very much. Very pleased to be here. So this Alexander technique that I've heard of but had no real knowledge about what it was or, in fact, who invented it, you have great knowledge because not only have you made a documentary, but you've researched the man. Written a book. And written a book and know all about the technique. So we're really keen to find out more. Can we yes. please just start, though, because you are a musician and that's how you learned about the Alexander mm. technique because you were having problems with your back? Yes, that's right. I played the piano as my main instrument. You didn't have to carry that with you to <laughs> gigs, did you? No, okay. and viola was a second instrument. Now, the viola is very heavy to hold up and play. Play, and yes. I developed some backache and I was looking around for answers and I'd, again I'd heard this label Alexander Technique. I was fortunate enough in Melbourne to find someone who was a highly qualified teacher and I had lessons because you go, it's not therapy, you go as a pupil to get better knowledge of how to care for yourself. And I realised in those first few lessons, I simply did not know how to sit, but how to move as well, not just a posture thing, it's the quality of how we move. And after I'd had those lessons, I was so interested. I thought, I'd like to teach this. But this was the early 1970s. There were no teacher training courses in Australia. It's a three-year full-time training. So I went to London. I did two years there and then for various reasons had to come home. But by the early 1980s, a new school had opened in Sydney. So I completed my three-year course went back to live in Melbourne and for some years taught at Melbourne University and the Victorian College of the Arts. It was while living in Melbourne in the early 1990s that I realised it was almost a hundred years ago that Alexander himself had lived in Melbourne in the 1890s hoping to have a career as an actor. And this is where it all began. And the interesting thing that you discovered was that, of course, he was an Australian, but people overseas never knew that. And more so, we didn't know that. At least yes. to my people like Muriel Matters, who, yes. who got basically was instrumental in getting the vote for women in London. Mm. You know, and she yes. came from South Australia. You know, who knew? But he lived That's in right. London for a long time. Yes, well, with Alexander, he'd actually grown up in Tasmania on the northwest coast. His grandfather had been sent to Van Diemen's Land in 1831 from England as a convict. Oh. Ah. He'd got his ticket of leave, and the family settled on the northwest coast, and then um, grandson, Fred came along in 1869 and after fairly sketchy schooling he got himself across to Melbourne 1890 marvelous Melbourne all that gold could buy and he was doing quite well as an actor then he developed voice problems but the problems only happened on stage when he spoke in a small area like I'm doing now he didn't get the voice problems oh. so he knew he didn't have a, a structural fault that he could never be an actor and the medical help at the time didn't make any difference. And he was so desperate for this acting career, he thought, I'm going to find out for myself what's happening on stage. So he got not only front-on mirrors, but side-on mirrors. And he stood there and he recited. Then he spoke as though talking to friends and he alternated the two actions. And what I'm summarising now was actually months of detailed observation mm. because he realised even at that thought of reciting, the chin came up, the head tipped back, this idea of projection and that puts enormous strain all around the throat area, but it also interferes with the breathing. Mm -hmm. So he retrained himself. He was sort himself. of squashing his throat and yes. his... Yeah. Or his, 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 uh, no, his trachea. Yeah, and yeah. he thought he was unusual in having these problems, but okay. once he'd solved his own problems and he started to look at his other fellow human beings, oh. 
it, people then, no microphones, and if someone was a lawyer or a politician, public life, clergyman, so many of them did this with the head getting pushing, out of kilter uh, to the top of the spine. Right. Well, it actually comes back and down on the top of the spine. So when Alexander stopped, yes, these... Yes, we all moved back. We're all, all to all to 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 that Because I can right feel on. what you're talking about. For, yeah. for us, these chairs are almost a bit too low, so we're sort of a bit squatting. And yeah. for everyone trying to push... St straight yeah, enough, to yeah. Straight, put, to push but it's, it's important not to try to hold a particular position. But once Alexander had solved his voice problems. He could have gone on with the acting career, but so many other people said to him, you were terrible for ages with your voice problems. What have you done? So right. he started to teach. Yeah. Right. And then doctors were sending patients with breathing problems. So by 1904, the doctors said, you should go to London with your work. That's what he did. And he worked in England and America for 50 years, never came back here. But the important thing was that in 1931 in London, London, people were saying to Alexander, we need teachers of your methods. So that's when he decided to train other people. He'd had one or two assistants, yes. but a formal training course in 1931 with seven people. Now the Alexander work is taught in more than 40 countries. Many of the famous actors, Hugh Jackman, Barry Humphreys, they all study Alexander work, but also the British Medical Journal in August 2008 has a report of a huge project done in England, £600,000 from the British Medical Research Council to research back pain and the Alexander Technique. Right. One of the most thorough evidence-based research projects. And the result was that the four groups of people who all had chronic back pain three weeks out of four, those that were given 24 Alexander lessons, so quite a bit of re-educating in daily mm. life, three days of back pain instead of 21 days per month. Interesting. Extraordinary. And yeah. the other groups that did other things that were nearly as successful with eliminating the back pain. Well, we've got a couple of pictures of children here. Um, yes. First of all, a little baby, with not wearing many clothes, <laughs> um, and the position that the child is in. Yes. Just, just tell us about... Well, you see, up, up until about four years of age, we all move well. And when we want to pick things up, we go into a beautiful squat position with a lovely line along the back, the head finely balanced, yep. knees well apart. And then after about four years of age, there's many reasons why we start to what we would call lose our length. Like this and other shot? And the next got. shot, mm -hmm. yes, it's just one of many. Once children go to school, but it's not only the writing at the desk now, it's all the tablets and the iPhones yes, and yes. everyone bending at the yes. bottom of the neck. But the seven vertebrae in here, the hinge for the head is right up on top. And I'm not talking about finding a right position because we don't get up in the morning and think, I've got to keep my hand at a proper angle to the forearm via the wrist hinge. Mm. It's a hinge to move on. Mm. Similarly with this, but it's hinges here. So if I want to look down, I actually let the eyes drop, nod the nose, go off this hinge, and I can see as far as there, but it's better to hold it just out there. And that's yes, fine. Yes, rather than curve yourself over yeah. like a ball. And I've left the spine alone. And because the weight of the head is about the weight of a bowling ball and when oh, you have that on your fingers and you're going to bowl when you release that weight it's quite a yes. it's quite a surprising weight you yes. know we forget how much we weigh. That's right. And what often happens to people in office situation looking at the computer, they'll start off first thing in the morning looking at the screen and then gradually perhaps, what's that, what's that? And yeah, then they something. start to, the hands yeah. here, and by the end of the day, yes. the whole of the spine has been pulled over. Isn't that funny? Because recently we do have some staff in my husband's office and the girls were saying, could you please get me a footstool? because it pushed them back into the chair yes. so that they could they were feeling that through their shoulders yes um, but that helped it does help, but really it's it's too late once we have sat to think, now I've got to find my right posture, you as to it do were. It before you it, well, it's how you change from standing to sitting right. that determines the quality of the sitting. Right. And so most people, when they go to stand up, you'll see the chin come up, yeah. and that's actually chin. a whiplash. 
and often the hands are here, the shoulders come up, and people push to get to the feet. Oh, I'm pushing more the older <laughs> I'm getting, I tell you. The well, arms are coming into play a lot more. Well, there's nothing wrong with having the hands here, but then it's important not to tip four or five kilos weight of the head down that way when you've got the, the idea you want to be up over your feet. So that we use a phrase, because when we teach, we work with our hands. It's not massage or chiropractic. I would stand alongside a pupil who was sitting and my hands probably very gently go around this area to guide the pupil, to let the head lead. So in that guiding movement, they get the um, awareness and perception of doing a movement more easily and less effort and then that starts to let them build new knowledge. It's the hundreds it's of hours to fix hours, hundreds of hours of bad uh, movement and posture, isn't it? When you learn something incorrectly, it takes yes. a long time to retrain the brain. Well, yes, there's all this neuroplasticity now about the brain and retraining. It, just because we've maybe taken years to develop bad habits, we don't have to take more years to undo them. Mm. We can undo them very quickly. Having we, the knowledge yeah, just we, of what to do. We've got this little, uh, uh, this little diagram, if you like, of the back. Can we just pan down that yes. chap so we can just see that? This is interesting because um, this basically shows the straightness of the spine with the little up arrow here, over here, um, with the crumbling arrow yes. when, you, when you're sort of sitting and moving and what it does to your vertebrae. Yeah. But it's important not to think of a straight spine. The spine has four gentle curves and we must, because that's the problem often with words and if people think of straight, that they go stiff mm. when it's, it's about how we move, not what we do, but how. But first of all, we have to stop the harmful. And so, a simple example, people are sitting and the phone goes, we get set to, mm. So that phone is a tremendous stimulus to respond. But if the phone goes, I immediately just think, wait, and then I choose how to stand up and go to the phone to lift it up to my ear, mm -hmm. not go down to meet it to and take it. No, yes. I do that all the time. Yes. Yeah. You wrote this book. Um, we're just running out of time. I'd just like people to understand that you wrote this book when? I did that in the 1990s because I did a lot of research about his Australian years. And at that stage, there was no full biography of Alexander. There is now. But I just wanted people in Europe and America to have an idea of where he he'd come from. Mm. And then I'd been sitting on this material for a long time. Finally, I've now made a 70-minute documentary film about his life and his work. And it was first shown in August in Ireland at the 10th World Alexander Congress. Congratulations. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. It's been an absolute pleasure. As soon as we finish this, I'm going to have a long chat with you. <laughs> I'm really interested to know because I've had issues with my voice for a, a couple of years and maybe you think you know what you're doing, maybe we don't, you know, in ourselves. We need help. Yeah. We have to go and we'll be Lovely back to meet soon you. with you. our next very special guest, Connie Diana. See you then. Welcome back to our time. Um, I have Connie uh, Diano with me. Welcome to the program, Connie. Now, thank you, Janice. We are going to talk about your career. Now, how did you start in this business? Now, just to explain that Connie is actually a life coach, which is quite an interesting career. How did you come to be a life coach? Yes, it is, Janice, and um, it was actually quite an interesting journey that I've had because. At the time when I chose to do this, I didn't even know that um, a life coach existed. Right. I didn't know what that was. Um, but what I did know is that there was just something missing in my life. Um, my last child was finishing her a year 12, yeah. and I knew she was heading off. She was going to have a gap year, going off to uni. Um, and I looked at my life and thought, OK, well, I now have some time in my hands. What can I do for me? And not only that, I had extra money now. There's oh. no more school fees. I know and that feeling. All that. Isn't that <laughs> great? And so I thought, well, what can I do mm. that, um, you know, that, that will be fulfilling and, and take me 
to the next chapter of my life because right. I saw now that I had a big window of opportunity waiting for me. Yes. So I just didn't know what that something was though. So what got you there? What, what actually happened to, to get you into that career? Well, it was funny because I had um, attended a Bob Proctor um, seminar not long before that, a few months before that, and um, I bought the CDs and I was watching the CDs with my son. He's a musician. Yes. And, um, and he was getting really motivated by it. And, um, and I said, oh, you're lucky, Andrew, you know, because you know what it is you want to do and what mm. you can go mm. for. I said, but I don't know what it is I want. And he said, well, Mum, just keep watching and you'll figure it out. And I went, oh, OK. So I kept watching and I said, but the thing is, I want to do what he's doing. Oh. And he said, well, go do that. And so I went, oh, <laughs> that's what I did. But oh, how do I do that? Yes. <laughs> so um, I actually asked my sister, I said, how do I sort of find something that I don't know what I'm looking for? And she said, I don't know, look in the paper. What? So, OK. So I did. <laughs> this was, you know, back when we, Google wasn't that up there at right, the time, you yes. know, we didn't have that, that um, advantage. And so I looked in the paper and I was just flicking through and I saw a little ad and it was about this size and it said, become a life coach. And my first... And the lights went on. It, and you just... But I said, what's that? But I rang my friend and I said, hey, what's a life coach? And she said, I don't know. And I said, hey, do you want to be, become one? <laughs> she said, no. I said, oh, I think I do. She goes, well, what is it? I said, I don't know, but I'm going to give it a try. Yeah. So I registered to, for this seminar to go to this free seminar to, um, you know, find out about it. And lo and behold, as soon as I heard, I just intuitively knew it was the right thing for me. Yeah. And, um, and that was... Goodness me, that was 2006, so oh, wow. do the sums, yes. yes. So uh, I, off I went. Actually, it was 2005, because 2006 I, I started um, my business, Beyond Your Now. So, um, yeah, off I went. I went to Melbourne, actually, because that's where I had to study and uh, get my diploma in, right. in life coaching, which I did. Along with how many others? How uh, many other people would have chosen that same thing? Well, actually, in the class that I was in... Um, it was, I think we were 25 in the class at, the, at that time. Really? And it was still relatively new in Australia. It wasn't um, that heard of. And I know that when I came back um, to Adelaide and people would say to me, what are you doing? And I would say, oh, I'm, I'm studying to be a life coach. And they'd go, what's that? Yeah. And I'd go, yeah, <laughs> right. That was, my, that was my question too. But I found that over this time, it's incredible now how much the industry has grown. So who would come to you then? I mean, what sort of people are you seeing and helping? Well, it was very much the people like I was back then, yeah. searching for something, right. knowing that there's just something missing in their life. Yeah. Um, so they're looking, looking for that fulfilment. So people, but it comes up in different areas. So it'll come up, for some, it comes up in the area of their career. And they'll say, something's missing in my life. I'm not in the job I like. Right. Some will say it's in my relationship. Some will say it's in their health. Um, so it shows up for, for people differently. OK, so um, if all those different things what do you do then do you then sort of channel them off to see people that need to help them or how, how do you help them no well the, the beautiful thing about life coaching and what that actually does is, is it, it assumes that um, it works on the on the on the precipice that you have um, everything that you need within you right. so it works on that assumption so it doesn't you don't need to be fixed all you need to be is awakened as to what your the genius in you you know so um, wow. so that's what life coaching actually does it looks at your current situation yes um, and then takes you from there to to where you need to go to what your desired outcome is so that's that's pretty much what I do is reconnecting them back with themselves so that mm. they can find the answers within um, um, and carry them through. through. But yeah. we were just saying before, though, it's, um, you know, when you've, you've had your children, um, and it's called the empty nest when your children all leave home, and that's when you find, as you say, it's like I've got more money <laughs> for yeah. a start because yeah. you're not having to fill the fridge every five seconds. But, um, and I, I've felt the same way. I've got three boys and when they left home, I actually felt quite lost and quite depressed for a while until somebody said to me, you've actually been made redundant. You've lost a job. And yeah. it just went, wow, yes. 
Yeah. Well, I have. Absolutely. And a job that I loved. Yeah. You know, and so then to find something else to fill that that need. So and you have to deal with well, you obviously that's something that you have to deal with with people that come to you. Absolutely, and and that I find especially that is a big one that's come up for a lot of people because um, being made redundant, nobody likes that. No matter what your mm. job is, mm. you know, even if it's in a job you don't like, and you're told you've been made redundant, there's a certain amount of like, oh, okay, well, I wasn't good enough. No, um, I'm no longer needed. I'm no longer um, wanted. And that feeling there, that's innate in all of us that we want that. We want to feel wanted sure. and needed. So when when that is taken away from us, then it brings up. It starts to put us into the hormones of stress, and and we become very unhappy with our current situation. Yeah. So, yes, um, people came to me and I would get people that were really excited, like myself, and looked, well, what can I do? Um, I have my life ahead of me now. Yeah. I saw it as, well. Wow, I'm 21 again, you know. <laughs> Good for you. Um, I can do whatever I, whatever yes. I want. And yeah. this time, there is no one I need permission from. You know, I, I'm my own master. Mm. But there, there were others that actually did fall into deep depression and, and um, turned to things like gambling and um, uh, different. You hear of that quite oh, a lot, absolutely, don't you? yeah. Just go to yeah. the pub around the corner and play the pokies. Yeah. And um, just use your time that way, which is really, that's pretty frightening. Yeah. And I, I think that the one thing to really to let people know, I mean, and, and the advice I give to my clients that are in that situation, I say plan for it before it actually happens so that it's no big shock mm. to the system then mm. once the children do leave. Um, and You've the, got something to look forward to. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And I mean, there are all these courses that too, and WEA courses and things like that that you can do. And, you know, we've had um, people on the program talking about courses at TAFE that you can do at, at any oh, age. Oh, there's so there's much. There's a lot of things yeah, out there. Yeah, there is so much out there. And, and even in, if you if you don't need the money, go in and do some volunteer work. I was just about to say yeah, that too. Yeah, um, and see what it is and, and tap into, into your strengths. You know, what are you're good at um, and go and explore that mm. and so look there is just so much out there it's a smorgasbord really um, and it's it, it really is dependent on what we want to focus on sure you know um, well Connie honestly I think uh, you've probably opened up a few people's eyes talking about what you've been through yeah. if you feel that um, you're at a loose end I mean it really well Connie's here for you to talk to but also just there's a lot of things out there that as you say volunteer work or courses that you can do to fill your time you don't have to sit there um, twiddling your thumbs and feeling lost yeah or go back into the workforce or even or you know some oh. of the uh, um, parents are in the workforce and still have this I mean I was actually a full-time working as a you know full-time um, employment yeah when I did my my coaching and I was doing the two in tandem um, just like we do when we when we're working mothers yes. we do the two of course in, in tandem so just you have that extra time and oh. so well okay let, let's do something oh. so um, just stretch yourself, really yeah. stretch yourself and, and challenge yourself. And That's it. Um, challenge yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have this, this little plaque that I've done for myself, and I'd say adventure, you know, um, to expect the unexpected, um, you know, and to embrace the unknown. There you go. Because that was a big one for me. Yeah, I couldn't yeah. embrace the unknown because I had to know, and I think that a lot <laughs> of us fall into that category. Absolutely. But, yeah. Look, we've run out of time, Connie. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'd love to talk to you more and more about this. Um, honestly, if you are feeling a little lost, um, just take note of what Connie said. It's been lovely having you on the program. Thank you so Thank much you, for Jess. coming and talking it's to us. It's been lovely to be here. Thank you. Stay with us. We'll be back after this break. Malcolm. Janice. I know. What a, I'm 
thought we had a very interesting program. I know I say that all the time, interesting. You do. But I, I, sorry, it, I apologise. It's quite all right, because <laughs> it's important that you enjoy the people that we have to present for you, and we'd love to know where you're actually watching our program and when. Where being which it's city state. you're watching in, because the show goes all over Australia, and when, because it's played at different, different times, times during the night and day, <laughs> because it's so fabulous. <laughs> and you can look for us on Facebook because it's, oh, there it is, right there in front of you. Um, and on YouTube. Of course, because we're now putting the programs up on YouTube. So if you have a, a, if there's a subject or a person we interview that you would like to know more about, it's very simple. You can just go have a look on YouTube and see the program again. The marvels of modern technology. <laughs> Thank you. See you next see time you on then. our time. Keep yourself nice till then. Bye.